been at the doctor's all afternoon. I don't know. I haven't heard anything from her. Um, so y'all remember her in prayer. We're going to go ahead and disconnect this right now. And um, Ludina is out of town. And I don't know where everybody else is. So we're just going to go ahead and get started. There is approximately three more lessons left in this series. And then if you haven't been here for the first part of the series, go back and watch them online so that you can be, have all of them, okay? Last month, you were given a homework assignment. For those that was here, did you do it? Kinda. How far did you think you got into it? Yeah. yeah. One person in 30 days? Okay. Hang on in the lesson. Um, it's very important if we want to see our church grow that we invite people to church. Okay? It's very important. Last month's homework lesson was in the next 30 days, which it was approximately 30 days between now and our last lesson. You invite one person a day to church. You know, it could average. You may go several days without inviting somebody, but then all of a sudden you invite 30 people at one time. Okay? So, but the point is, is to get us used to inviting people to church. Because as leaders or as Christians, has nothing to do with leadership, has nothing to do with holding a position. Our one commission is to be Christ-like. And then to be Christ-like, we have been told by God to go out and compel them, which means to invite them to come into the house of God. So we are in the process of winning souls. If we don't, then who will? Okay, so let's keep that in mind because you're going to have another homework lesson this month. But tonight we're going to talk about the qualities of a leader. Now tell me, what do you think a leader is, Alicia? Okay, Jackson? Somebody that'll be uh, that's firm, uh, caring at the same time. Okay. Sister Nate, what do you think a leader is? Hmm. A leader is a, is a person who leads people. And uh, I think the, the first quality of it, you don't want the quality, you mm -hmm. just want to know what it is. Mm hmm. Oh, quality. It's a person who <clears throat> believe people and loves God. Okay. Sister Kate Clatter, what do you think a leader is? Person who teaches by example. Matt? She picked the one that I was going to say. Okay. Um, lead by example is uh, humble and submissive to authority above them. I like that. Each thing that you said is a quality of a leader, okay? But before we can become leaders, we have to learn to be servants, as we've expressed many times over the last few weeks. As a leader, number one, we must be baptized with the power of prayer and fasting. We are not going to get anywhere until we learn to pray, until we learn to fast. We have got to have a personal life of prayer, fasting, studying, personal relationship with God. Luke chapter 4 verse 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has set me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. I have heard people in leadership positions over the years make statements such as, and if I hear them here, I'm going to nail you. I'm not going to go knock doors because I am the associate pastor. I'm not going to go pray for that person. If they need prayer, they can call me and we'll make an appointment for them to come to church and I'll pray for them then. And they're in the hospital. I'm not going to teach a home Bible study. I'm busy enough being a Sunday school teacher. 
One of the things about a leadership and one of the things about being a child of God, period, is to do the work of God whenever and wherever it needs to be done. And sometimes it means doing the work of God even when we're maybe even be a little bit uncomfortable. When my husband and I first got married, we went to preach a revival somewhere. And the funny thing is, I'd been a choir leader. I had already been singing. I did specials and all. But there was just a spirit of shyness, if you can imagine that, that hit me after we got married. And we went and did several revivals. And I just, I sat there. I prayed for people in the altar and back just preaching and all. But I didn't sing specials or anything like that. And I had a lady walk up to me one night and she literally broke my heart because she said, well, what good are you as a preacher's wife if you don't sing? And I remember going back to the home church and just crying to my pastor's wife because I felt totally useless to my husband in his ministry. And the thing was, it gave me a mindset that I could not do this. Okay. And I had to get beyond that mindset. So the point is, is even when we're uncomfortable, sometimes we got to get out of that box and move into another sphere. When we moved to the state of New York, we had no music. Zilch. Now, I'd taken piano lessons years ago, okay? But there's a difference between taking piano lessons and being set down in front of a keyboard and told, now play, because we have no music. And you're sitting there looking at those 88 keys going, what am I supposed to do with this? Okay? And then you start playing. And as time goes on... Necessity became the mother of invention, and I got creative. Okay, but the point is, is we have to get out of the box, and we cannot get a mindset as a leader. Here in the scripture, it says, "I came to preach to the poor." We can't say, "Well, I'm only going to preach to a certain segment of the population." To heal the brokenhearted. We can't say, well, I only want to talk to certain people. I don't want to deal with those issues. To preach deliverance to the captives. Recovering of the sight to the blind and set at liberty them that are bruised. When we are working within the ministry, and even if not a pulpit ministry, because I need you to understand, as a child of God, you are called to a ministry. And it's a ministry of saving souls. Regardless if that ever develops into a pulpit ministry or not, you still have a ministry of soul saving. And soul saving means that we reach all kind of people at all kind of levels. You have to learn to be able to hobnob and you have to learn to be able to get down to the nitty gritty. This is all part of it. Matthew 21, 13 says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. As leaders, we need to set the example of prayer. We come in here and everybody else is wanting to talk about it's Sunday's Easter egg hunt. That's fine. We need to find a place to pray. Because we're setting the example. And eventually, after they see that our prayers are going to be louder than they're talking, they're either going to join us or they're going to go outside. And I've seen that happen. But this house needs to be his house, needs to be called a house of prayer. Matthew 17, 21 says, these go out by prayer and fasting. There are some demons and some devils and some people, because we can cast demons and devils out, but we can't cast people out of people. Okay, but there are some demons and devils and spirits that we're going to face that we are only going to be able to control them through prayer and fasting. And if we're not prayed up and stayed up, we may get ourselves into trouble like the seven sons of Siva. So we need to be prayed up and stayed up and fasted up and ready to do battle for the kingdom of God. Second Corinthians eleven twenty seven says in fastings often. What is the point of fasting? Just to go without food or to lose weight? No. Nope. And you know, ironically, unless you go on an extended fast, you very seldom lose weight on fasting. Very seldom. Okay. And if you go to fast just to lose weight, then we're fasting for the wrong reasons. Because when we go into a church fast, we are fasting for souls. We are fasting to bring our bodies under submission. Pastor and I for several years did the 21-day Daniel's fast. And that's where basically it's just nuts and grains, um, no sweet breads, no white breads. It had to be whole wheat, and I mean totally whole wheat bread and things like that for 21 days. No sugars, no candies, stuff like that. And we did that, and the hardest thing for me to give up was my sodas. I mean, I was counting the days 
when I first started the fast. But by the end of the fast, I wasn't counting the days anymore, okay? Because I brought my body under submission. And that is the point of fasting is to bring ourselves under submission. Our pastor one time called a fast of any secular reading that the only reading that could be done unless it was job oriented was your Bible. So we need to sometimes do that. Put those video machines up, cut your TVs off and get your mind on the word and the work of God. Now, prayer and fasting is the plug in our Christian walk. You cannot have a relationship with the master without prayer and without fasting. You may be able to perform a work, but it will be a work without the blessings of God. Now, there are people that seem to be blessed of God, but they're not teaching the truth. And we understand what I'm talking about here. They're teaching things that's not even in scripture, but they seem to be blessed of God. What's the difference? They're good motivators. They're good motivational speakers. And, you know, I've listened to a few of them and they're good motivational speakers. They can make you feel good about yourself. But there's a difference between a motivational speaker and the teaching of the word of God. And as much as I like to listen to a good motivational speaker, Lord, help me. That's not going to get me into heaven, but the word of God is. And if it hurts, let it hurt because I would rather be hurt than, and kept out of hell than be motivated and go to hell. So we need to make sure that we are familiar with the word of God and that we are doing the word of God and not just doing busy work. Number two, you must be and have a Christian lifestyle that is holy and not worldly. In the day and age that we live in today, everybody's got the mentality or the world has the mentality and a lot of denominational churches have the mentality that that is yesterday's teaching. We don't have to live by it today. Well, let's see what the word of God says. Second Corinthians six seventeen says, come ye out from among them, touch not the unclean thing. Romans 12 and 1 says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If God cannot stand in the presence of sin, if God will not tolerate sin, then how can we be in his presence when we have known and blessed, for lack of a better word, sin in our lives? Because we have justified it in a out justified it into meaning that it can do what we want to today and still make it to heaven because the word of God is old fashioned. But that is not the word of God. We're told not to have anything to do with it. We're told to come out from among them and be ye separate. It doesn't matter when it comes to the word of God. It does not matter what we say. It does not matter what we believe. It matters what we obey. And as leaders, we have to set the example. Really, as children of God, we have to set the example. Because I'm going to tell you something right now. I don't care what the world says. They can say all they want to. I don't believe it anymore. You don't have to live that way. But the minute you change the word of God, the minute I change the word of God, they're going to point their fingers at us and say, but you knew better. I may not believe it. But I've looked up to you for all these years. When I was in high school, going through most of my school years, once my parents got in the church, not putting on lay, um, pants anymore, and there was a football player. Oh, my goodness. Blonde-headed, blue-eyed, six-packs, probably plus. And he was just, I wanted to date Bubba. Bubba dated the head of the cheerleading team. And has, I'll tell you one better. His name was Bubba Cheeks. <laughs> Got it? Okay. And um, Bubba and I, Bubba wouldn't even speak to me. Now, I knew his girlfriend, Tammy, because I tried out for the cheerleading team, and Tammy and I were friends, but Bubba was in his own little world. And when Bubba and I'd pass in the hallway, him and Tammy were usually together, and I'd speak to Tammy, and they'd go on down the road. But one day I decided that the reason Bubba didn't pay me any attention is I didn't look like the other girls. 
So I went to town. My aunt took me to town who was not living for God. We picked out a pants suit. And I went to school that Monday morning thinking I was hot stuff. They were green, bell-bottom, hip-hugging pants. Now, I'm dating myself now. And Bubba walked up to me, and I thought, oh, boy, I've finally done it. And he looked at me, Alicia, and he said, can I ask you a question? And I said, yes, thinking he was fixing to ask me out. Mm -hmm. I got a slap down. Because he looked at me, he said, why? He said, all these years, I've looked up to you because you were different. He said, now you're just like the rest of the girls. And he turned around and walked off. I went home, took those pants off, and never put them back on. Because what I thought, the minute I thought I needed to drop my standards to gain the attention of somebody that I wanted his attention, I already had his attention. And sometimes we mess up our testimonies because the devil gets in our head and he says, you know, you could really do this or you can really do that or you shouldn't do this. You should do more of this. We need to listen to the word of God. And as leaders, we have to set the example because we can do more damage in one mistake. I never got Bubba to talk to me again. One mistake did more damage in that situation than all my years of thinking feeling sorry for myself so we need to pay attention and remember that we have to set the example because the minute we change the word of god the minute we water down the word of god regardless of what they've been telling you they're going to nail you and not only are they going to nail you god's going to nail you and that's even worse because we cannot change the word of god holiness is not only for the saints it is for the leadership. Sometimes leadership gets it in their heads that we live by a different standard than the ones on the pews do. No. We all serve the same God and we all live by the same word of God. And if it's wrong for me, it's wrong for you. If it's wrong for Brother Yuzapan, it's wrong for Matthew. If the Bible says it's wrong, then it's wrong. So we need to understand that holiness is for every child of God. If we cannot line up to the word of God, we should not be trying to teach and lead others because this is called hypocrisy. The practice, which is simply the practice of claiming to have moral standards or beliefs to which one's own behavior does not conform. You ever had somebody tell you, my, my uncle was bad about this. He would sit there and tell his sons, I better not ever catch you with drugs. Well, I got pictures of him holding nickel bags of marijuana. Okay, and I asked him one day, I said, Uncle Eddie, why are you doing that? He said, because you do as I say, not as I do. That's not scripture. And as a parent or as a pastor or as a Sunday school teacher or as a child of God, we're going to be held accountable for what we teach others. And if I teach you, Sister Alicia, not to do something and I'm doing it myself, then I'm a hypocrite and I'm going to be held accountable for that. We have to set the example, both in words and deed. This brings into greater understanding the scripture of Hebrews 12, 14. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. Now, that we live in a world today that tells us that it doesn't matter how we live. It doesn't matter what we believe or what we do. That we're all serving the same God and we're all going to the same heaven. That is not Bible. The Bible here tells us that if we're not in obedience to scripture, we are not going to go to heaven. The Bible tells us there's only one way to heaven. The Bible tells us that straight and narrow is the path into heaven. So we need to make sure that we line up to the scripture. 1 Peter 1.15 says, but, he, but as he which hath called you is holy... So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now that statement there, conversation, all manner of conversation, simply means the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you look, the way you act, however many times you roll your eyeballs. You know, my eyes get plenty of exercise because I roll them all the time. 
Okay, so but we have to be careful of these things because that is part of our conversation and we have to keep our conversation holy. A lot of people look the part, you know, the collars up to here and the sleeves down to here and the skirts are down to here and your pants for the men are loose enough. And, you know, we look the part, but we got a stinking attitude. We got a nasty mouth. Behind closed doors, we slap people around. We verbally cut them down and all this stuff. I know, you know, we all like to have fun. You know, I like to have fun. We was giving the guys at the picnic the other day a hard time. But we were having fun. Us ladies was having fun with, at, at our gentleman's expense. But I will tell you in a heartbeat that there's very few people I love and respect, very few men I love and respect as much as I love and respect my husband. He is both my husband and my pastor and the head of my home. So, you know, what we do in fun and jest, even though we need to be careful that the perception of those around us don't take it wrong. Okay? So we need to be careful that perception. The way people perceive us sometimes, even though they can get the wrong perception of us, can damage our testimonies to them. So we need to make sure that all of our conversation is holy as God is holy. Number three, you must have a passion for the work of God. I must do this. I will do this. You ever met somebody that says, you know, I want to do that. I really would like to have that pink jacket sitting there on the back of that chair. I really want that pink jacket there. I'd like to have that pink jacket. I can sit here and say how much I want it all day long, but until I go over here and pick it up, I don't have any passion for it. I don't really want it that bad. And it's the same in your walk with God. It's the same in winning souls. If you have a burden for the children, then you need to be praying for the children. You need to have a passion for the children. You need to be, if nobody else shows up for the Sunday school meeting, you need to be here for the Sunday school meeting. Because as a leader, you're setting the example. You're training future Sunday school teachers. You're training future drummers. Matthew, you're training future magicians. Magic <laughs> yeah, the ones that play the music, not does the magic. <laughs> you're training future saints and prayer warriors and organ players, Sister Kit Clatter, and prayer warriors, Sister Nate, and... People who work in the sound booth, Brother Nathan, we're training future us's. Now, do we like what we see? Am I what I need to be for God? Do I want Ezra to grow up to be just like me? No, really, I want her to grow up to be better than me. So I want to instill in her everything I can. I want a passion. Do you, want, do you have a passion to get out of these four walls? then we need to be acting on that passion. Do you have a passion to see souls saved? How many did you invite this month? Do you have a passion to see people come back to the house of God? How many have we contacted that's been here in the past month and invited them back? We have got to have a passion. You have to have a passion to fast, to pray, to live godly, and to win souls. You must have a passion to be reliable. My parents brought me up with the mentality, you're only as good as your word. If you tell somebody you're going to do something, and we all know things happen, okay? We know that. But if you tell somebody that you're going to do something, then you need to do everything within your effort to do it. Because one thing that I've heard over the years is this person, and I will never forget in the church in Texas, I had an individual come to me. She said, where is so-and-so? And I said, I don't know. And they said, they have been inviting me to church for six months. And said, I finally come to church and they're not here. Where are they? And this person had a bad habit of hitting Miss Church. So what did that do for their example? The world today seems not to think much of accountability, but God does. In the world of a child of God, accountability is mandatory. 
Number four, we must be faithful. Now, I want you to listen to me just a minute. Talent without faithfulness is useless. Now, we've got talent in this church. This is probably one of the most talented and used talented churches that we have pastored. We have talent in this church. But you can play these instruments like the angels in heaven. You can have a voice like the archangels. You can teach like the master and the disciples. You can bring people to church. There's some people that can walk up to a telephone pole, get that telephone pole to break itself off from the ground and walk in this church. They just have that talent. But your talent without faithfulness to the work of God and the word of God is absolutely useless. So we need to learn. Second Timothy 2 and 2 says, And all things that hath heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others. What Timothy is saying here is everything that I've learned, I want to give it to faithful men, faithful women who will spread this gospel, who will do the work that needs to be done so that they will be faithful and teach others. I could teach you how to be a Sunday school teacher, but if you are not faithful and do it, then I've wasted my time and you're wasting your talents. We must be faithful and accountable for our actions and teachings as leaders. And we are accountable for who we pass this mantle to. That's why when you come to pastor and you say, I feel a, God, a call of God on my life. I want to preach. He might hand you his shoes and say, go polish them. He might say, go clean the baptistry out. Because if you're not willing to be a servant, you're not going to stand in the pulpit. Okay? Understand that with a calling comes accountability and qualification. Now, there's a saying that kind of ran through the religious world a few years ago. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the the called. While I understand the premises of that statement, during that time period, we put a lot of novices in the pulpit. Okay? And their damage can be done by a novice. Well, everybody has to begin somewhere. That's true. But if you're not teaching home Bible studies, if you're not inviting people to church, if you're not teaching a Sunday school class, and believe me, I know not everybody's called to be a Sunday school teacher. I'm not. Okay, y'all have heard my husband's version of my idea of students in Sunday school. They walk in, we slip them in a Velcro suit, and we glue them to a Velcro wall. Then we have a good Sunday school class. Okay, but we know that that can't be done. So it takes special people to get in there with 15 toddlers. Okay, it takes special people to do this. But at the same time... You do need to have some study under your belt. You do need to have some qualifications. You do need to be doing these things before you step into different roles. You can't wake up in the morning, Jackson, say, I want to be a brain surgeon. Not my brain. I, I got a few people I'll send you to, but not my brain. Why? Because you've got to be qualified to be a brain surgeon. Okay. Well, so what are we supposed to do first? We prove the fact that this is what we want to do by starting here, which means we invite people to church. We teach home Bible studies. And as you're going and you start developing your spiritual walk with God, your callings will become more clear. I've had people ask me, how do I know what my talent is? You learn what your talent is by developing your talents. And you may say, I want to be a Sunday school teacher and actually go in there and start teaching and realize that 15 toddlers is not for you. Okay? But you can go into the teen class and grasp their attention in a heartbeat. Okay? And so you're developing 
your talents and you're realizing places that you can fit in. One thing about being in the will of God is doing the work of God wherever you're needed in order to find the will of God of where you may want to be. And sometimes what we want to do, remember that ministries change as time goes on. You know, I, for years I taught Sunday school. All levels of Sunday school. 12 years old, I was teaching Sunday school. Okay? But now my ministry has changed. Will I still teach Sunday school? I offered to do your classes past the Sunday before if I needed to. But Sister Cruz took care of it. Okay, yes, I'll still teach Sunday school. Why? Because there was a need. Okay, and in order to be in leadership, we have to prove I'm willing to step in. Be a child of God. Concerned for souls, we say, I will step in where I need to be when I can. There is no long-term success without faithfulness. We've had individuals tell us over the years, well, I want to be in the ministry. Okay, this is what you need to do. And we'll give them steps to do it. And they'll do it for a couple of weeks. And then we don't see them again for a couple of weeks. They'll come back. I want to do and it's a repeat pattern over and over and over and over. Okay, well, without the faithfulness, you're not going to have success. And success doesn't mean you become some big-time camp meeting preacher or teaching general conference or anything. Success means you're doing what God wants you to do. There can be nothing more successful than being in the will of God and doing what he calls us to do. Faith moves mountains. Yes. But faithfulness will get you over that mountain. And my page is not wanting to turn. Okay, let's talk about real quickly here. Nine things of a leader. Now, when I'm saying leader tonight, I am using child of God and leader hand in hand. Because these are things that just children of God in general should be doing. But at the same time, when you're wanting to graduate from kindergarten to first grade, you're now required some more things. Number one, say yes to the right things. Not just say yes. For example, if you know, Matthew, that this coming Friday night, You've got an obligation at the school and that you absolutely cannot get out of it. And pastor says, Matthew, i got a Bible study with this young man Friday night. I need you to come and help me. Don't say yes just because the pastor asked you to. Look at him and say, Pastor, I'm sorry, but I am obligated Friday night. Can we do it Saturday morning? See if it can be flexible. Okay? Don't say yes just to say yes and then not show up and the pastor expecting you. That's a no-no. Okay? But on the same vein of thought, don't say no, just say no. Because we're in the business of winning souls. Also, in that same line of thought, if you know that you're not ready for something, say Jackson, Brother Use a Pen, says, I want you to rewire my office Saturday morning. And you know you don't know nothing about rewiring that office. Tell him. Okay? And then maybe you and Nate can get together and rewire the office. And he could teach you something. And then the next time you may be able to do what little job needs to be done on your own. Be teachable. That's also a quality of a leader. And be willing to teach. That's qualities of a leader. Number two, know what expectations are and be prepared to meet them. There is nothing wrong with asking questions. Okay? If I was to come to Sister Kicklider and say, Sister Kicklider, would you please take care of the children's banquet this year at Christmas time? Ask me, okay, how many kids are we planning on? What night do you want to do it on? Ask me the expectations of it. Make sure you have the answers and be prepared to meet them. I don't like doing things at the last minute. Okay, so I usually give everybody enough notice. If I do it at the last minute, that's because it was dropped on me at the last minute. Okay, but I like to give everybody. You know, I start aggravating Matthew about the third week of the month. I need your dates for music ministry. Sometimes I start at the first of the month. It just depends on how busy it's going to be. 
So, you know, know the expectations. Number three, ask the right questions. If we was to tell you, I want y'all to teach a Bible study. Um, Jack said, I want a Bible study this month. How many? The one hour or exploring God's word? Okay. That way you know what is expected of you. On the flip side of that, I need to try to be just as clear as possible. But if you don't understand, then ask. Okay. If Brother Holland says we got a Sunday school meeting next Saturday morning, make sure you know what time. Make sure you're here on time. Okay. If Sister Nate was to take visitation this coming week and she'd say, I'm going to have visitation. I need people to come with me. All right, find out what literature you need and find out where you're going. Make sure you ask the right questions and you know what's going to be done. Number four, manage your expectations. Don't overpromise. Welcome coaching and know the timelines and respect them. And I think we've covered them already. Number five, communicate. That's the number one problem with everything in this world is we don't communicate. Okay? And I love texting. Because if I can't talk on the phone at that moment, I just zip a text right back and that's the end of the story. Okay. But at the same time, we need to talk to each other. Okay. If I'm sitting on this front row and you send me a text and you're sitting right there, I'm going to turn around and look at you and give you what for. I'm sitting right here. Come talk to me. Okay. Because we need to communicate because a lot of problems can be solved before they get started if we communicate. All right. And also remember, as leadership, that does not always mean you'll be the one in charge. Okay. So we're having visitation this Saturday, and I put such a kick lighter in charge. Everyone that shows up for visitation needs to listen to what Sister Kick Lighter is telling them. Not everybody jumping in and say, well, let's do this, do this, do this. Do this. No. Sister Kick Lighter is in charge of it this Saturday. Brother Nate's in charge of it next Saturday. Brother Matthew, the following Saturday. But what we need to learn to listen. We've all got good ideas and we've all got, you know, there's, Matthew's in charge of the music. Except when I'm doing a special, if I was standing on that platform to sing with the praise group, I'm going to listen to him because he's in charge. Yes, I'm the pastor's wife. Yes, I'm the first lady. Yes, I'm do my own music junk. But he's in charge. So as leaders and examples, we yield to the one that's in charge of the program. And we're all in charge. We're all under submission to the pastor and the pastor's under submission to God. And we're all under submission to God. So learn to communicate. Number six, display a positive attitude. Ladies and gentlemen, if we do the right thing with the wrong attitude, it's still wrong. Because a wrong attitude just is a Get sister use a pen to get her righteous indignation stirred up. And that's not a pretty sight. Okay, so have a positive attitude. If you don't agree with the way something's being done, it's okay. But present it with the right attitude. If you don't like the 15 kids that's crawling the wall at the moment, don't go in there screaming your head off at them. Because there's parents sitting out here that hear it. And well, I'm not going to let my child be treated like that. And their kids won't be coming back to Sunday school. Okay? So we need to be careful and we need to present with a positive attitude. Even if you do want to Velcro them to the wall. Number seven, be a team player. You know, we can't always all be in charge, but we all need to work together. Okay? And there is no I in team. And I'm sure y'all have heard that before. Number eight, be flexible and be a motivator. There's going to be times that you're going to have to change your schedule. You know, Matthew pretty much has music ministry practice every other Thursday. But he also knows that he may have to change the schedule. We may go into revival. Or he may get a sudden call to go to work and he has to call everybody on his team and say, Hey, I'm sorry, but this unexpected thing came up. Or all of the praise group may all of a sudden get called into work. And they have to call Brother Matt and say, uh, we're sorry, but. And now if it's an every other Thursday night thing, well, Matthew's going to probably have to have a talk with y'all. <laughs> but at the same time, you know what I'm saying. We have to be flexible. This past Saturday, 
before, not this Saturday, Saturday a week ago, we had planned on having a visitation. Had a pretty good turnout, too. But it rained us out. Sister Nate took her flyers. She said, I'm going to the store and give them out. And she did. I took my stuff and I went and visited people that had been to church in the last few months. And went and visited them. So, you know, we had to change our schedule. We had to change our um, way we did it. But we still did it. Be a motivator. Encourage those that you're leading and number nine pay attention to details and handle adversity with grace that's probably one of the hardest things we're going to learn okay because when somebody looks at you and says well i don't believe what you're saying i don't want to do that sit down now or or flush the toilets and i'm just thinking of silly things right now but, you know, they're gonna, there's going to be times when people's going to fly back at you. Okay? And if you fly back at them, and I'm talking verbal, and you're flying back at them, then what are you creating? Just a hostile atmosphere. Learn when to speak and when to pray it out. Okay? So, you know, handle adversity with grace. There's gonna, I remember one time, um, Anne of mine, my mother told her, she said, Baldy, you need to go to church. You need to get your life right with God. You need to do what's right. And it made my aunt mad. My aunt stood up. Now, my mother, you got, she's five foot of dynamite. And when my aunt Baldy stood up, she drew back and she slapped. I mean, I heard the slap outside. My mother right in the face. And I was, uh, I was sitting there praying. I was in a cast at that time. And I sat there praying because I just knew it was all over but shouting. Next thing I knew, my Aunt Baldy come flying out the back door. She got the kids. She left. My mom come out the back door, and she said, are you ready to go inside? And I said, yes, ma'am. And we went inside, and I said, what happened? And she didn't say anything at that time, but later on she told me, she said, my first instinct was to beat the daylights out of her. And that little five-foot of dynamite would have. She said, but God checked me, and he said, you took that slap from me. And she said, so I shut my mouth and told her I loved her and I prayed for her. So we need to learn to be sensitive. We don't have to fight every battle. And that is one of the hardest lessons that we will learn. Do everything as you would be doing it unto God. And if we will keep that in the back of our minds, no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're doing, no matter what we're trying to decide to do, if we do it as we're doing it for God, doing it unto God, pretending God is right here, I'm doing this for him, we'll give him our very best. Now, there are several fundamentals that attract people to church. One, spiritually disciplined lives. You know, people basically do not like disorganization they may be disorganized but they don't like disorganization and when they come in here they want to know where the bathrooms are we really need to train some greeters because we had somebody here this past sunday didn't know where the bathrooms were and i know this is a tiny building so imagine if it was the lutheran church or the methodist church over here okay so we need to have greeters that say the bathrooms are right over here your child's sunday school's here your child's sunday school's here instead of waiting until we dismiss the sunday school class and all of us trying to figure out which classroom the kids go into okay so we need to be spiritually disciplined spiritually organized we need to have a personal prayer life we need to have a personal study life the bible says study to show thyself approve a workman that needeth not to be ashamed you know if somebody asks you something about scripture and you don't know, then we're honest and say, I don't know, but I will find out. Okay. Don't try to make it up. When it comes to Bible, do you hear me say the phrase, fake it till you make it? Not with scripture. Not with scripture because you may fake somebody into hell. Okay, so not with scripture. You look them in the eyeball and you say, I'm sorry, I do not have an answer for that. But if you will give me 24 hours, I will get with pastor, I will get with sister Juzapan, I'll get on my computer, I will get you an answer. And then holler. Okay. Number one, you're showing them that you're disciplined, that you care enough to study, that you care enough to get them an answer. 
Number two, see, hear, and respond to the pastor's vision. And there could only be one vision. We can't have 15 people having 15 visions showing us at 15 different church buildings. Okay, when it all comes down to where the rubber meets the road, and we can't have some saying, I mean, we can have it, but if you're wanting to get behind the pastor and see church growth, we all got to catch the pastor's vision. You can't be saying, well, in five years from now, where do you want to be in five years? Five years from now, I want to be sitting right where I'm at now. Uh-uh. Five years from now, I want to be in a church running 300. Five years from now, I want a choir loft that's full. Five years from now, I want a visitation program that goes out every week. I want a budget where we're having to print up flyers every week, church tracts every week, that we're baptizing people. We're baptizing so many people that we got to get Brother Cruz, Brother Usapan, and anybody else that we can get that's qualified to baptize people. We need discipleship classes that will fill up this building. You catching the vision? Okay. We need to have that vision. The Bible tells us without a vision, the people perish. Number three, you need to be observant. Look around at what needs to be done and be part of the solution, not a part of the problem. Okay. That simply means if you come in here on Saturday and you see we have puppy hair all over the pews, the vacuum cleaner is right in there. Pick it up, vacuum the pews. And I know it might not be your week to clean, but it's something that we see. If you see paper on the floor, bend over and pick it up. If you walk in the bathroom and the toilets need to be flushed, don't walk out of the ladies' bathroom and go to the handicapped bathroom and leave it in the toilet. Flush the toilets. Be part of the solution. You know we need to invite people to church. Go to pastor say, hey, I'll be glad to head up visitation this Saturday if you'll just print me up some flower, flyers. Get in the picture? Okay. Number four, have a get it done attitude. No matter what it takes, I'll get it done. I know. I'm going to talk to my Sunday school teacher right now since my other ones are not here. But I'll talk to the rest of my future helpers here too. I know that it gets discouraging because we use our Sunday school rooms as storage, as backup rooms, as trash rooms. <laughs> they're they're multi-purpose rooms, I promise you that. Okay, and I know it gets discouraging. But as Sunday school teacher on Sunday morning, you know that you're going to have bright-eyed, bushy-tailed kids coming in that room. Get in there and get it cleaned up. Get in there and get your Sunday school lesson prepared. Get your boards done. Whatever you can do to be ready for those kids when they walk in on Sunday morning. Especially with our mousey problem. Make sure there's no mouse droppings laying around. Okay? Because they're not healthy. So, we're going to have a get it done attitude. You know, nobody taught a Bible study this week. Let me see if I can find one. Maybe we need to start... Um, let me start teaching these kids how to sing in here and let them come out. Ask Brother Use Pen if I can have the kids come out and sing the books of the Bible or something in a couple of Sundays. There's so many things that we can do to promote within our own self. And as we get more excited, then it bleeds into our community. And number five, be accessible. Get involved with all things, not just what you want to. Ask yourself, what if God was as available to me as I am to him and his kingdom. Six, follow through, get it done, get it done well, and get it done on time. And then number seven, be faithful. Matthew chapter 25, getting ready to close. Matthew chapter 25, I'm going to read verses 45 through 51. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over his goods. But, and if, that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. 
and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour when he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and welling and gnashing of teeth. Now, which servant would we rather be? The faithful servant or the one that says, I've heard this preached all my life. I've heard this said all my life. I'm kind of bored with it. Kind of taking it for granted. So I think I'm going to become slack. And when we become slack, the master returns. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards. And stewards is just another word for leaders. Our Christians. That a man be found faithful. As children of God, we are required by God to be faithful. And remember where there is more visibility, that means more responsibility, which means more accountability. We must find ourselves faithful. We must find ourselves willing to be all that we can be for the kingdom of God. Any questions? No questions tonight? Wow, either I did that good, astounded you that well, or y'all just ready to go home. Ah, I got an honest person back there in sound booth. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's not a burning question, but how do you, uh, how do you approach as a leader mm -hmm. um, people who do not think that you are leadership material or that you have no business being in the place that you've been called to be or they um, I guess in general just don't support that you are in that leadership position okay that's a good question one thing that you need to remember is especially in when you're in your home turf okay the Bible says a prophet without honor in his own country Okay, when you're in your home turf, it is harder, especially to get people to respect the fact that you are now an adult. Okay, having grown up in a church, when I would started entering into leadership positions, like I said, I was teaching Sunday school at 12, and by 16, I was a choir leader. So there were people in that church, their mentality was, I changed your diapers, I've seen the good, I've seen the bad. And you're not telling me what to do because they were in my choir. Okay? But what people need to understand, this comes with good teaching from the platform to you. And then sometimes the pastor or the pastor's wife or whoever else can do it needs to step in and teach them. Like when I talk to each person that applies for the choir or I talk to each person that applies for Sunday school teacher I tell them Matthew's in charge of the praise group he is who you answer to and then if there's a problem that you and Matthew can't resolve then you come to pastor and I, I tell the Sunday school teachers brother Holland is in charge of the Sunday school department you go to him first if this cannot be resolved or something doesn't work out or you can't get a hold of him then you come to me whenever you have somebody that bucks your authority Remember what I said earlier, accept it with grace. All right. Now you can't back down from it because you're in charge. All right. So if they come to you and you say, okay, you know, you haven't been to praise group practice. And since Matthew asked the question, I'm going to use this. You haven't been to praise group practice in six weeks until you can start coming to praise group practice. I'm going to set you down from the platform because you don't know the songs. If they buck on that, and say, well, I'm not going to do that because, I mean, after all, I'm 6,700 years old and you're only 23 or 24, okay? So you're not going to tell me what to do. Been there, done that, so I understand, okay? Then you say, okay, well, then let's take this to the pastor. And then you take it to the pastor. Then the pastor reaffirms and backs up your position of authority. And that lets them know they're not going to be able to get around you if you're in the right. They're not going to be able to get around you because he's got the pastor's backing. Okay. And that's where the chain of command comes in. 
and we follow the chain of command, that way we have each other's backs, for lack of better terminology. Did that answer your question? And you're going to have people that's going to buck. I don't care if you're in your teens, your 20s, your 30s. You could be 100 years old and somebody's going to buck. There'll be that one little person that's 101. <laughs> or there'll be that person that says, well, I've been in the church for 50 years and you've only been in the church for 10 years. And the thing is, is it don't matter how long you've been in the way. The question is, are you in the way or are you doing a work for the Lord? Okay, so that makes a big difference there. But when you're in leadership and you do have a bucking of position, just like on your job, you have a chain of command. You try to address it at your level first, and then if that doesn't work, then you take it to the next level. Now, there'll be times, too, when, say, I'm going to use Alicia. Say, Alicia says, well, I'm not going to go to Matthew with this. I'm just going to go ahead and go to Sister Yuzapam. <laughs> a good leader will say, Alicia, did you go talk to Matthew? Well, no, I don't want to talk to Matthew about it. He's in charge of the music. You go talk to Matthew. If you can't get it resolved, then you and Matthew come to me. Okay? Because that's the right way. Now, if she comes to me and says, I need you to go to Brother Matthew with me because I don't feel like I can address this. That changes the story a little bit. And then I'll say, okay, let's call Brother Matthew. And I'll call Matthew and I'll say, Matthew, can you come or can we set up an appointment? And then the three of us will sit down and talk. But once again, we follow the chain of command. I'm not going to say, well, Matthew was in the wrong. He should have never said that to you. No, I'm not going to do that because I'm hearing one side of the story. And as the head of the music department, we need to hear his side of the story, see what his decision was, and I'm going to back what's right. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? And when you raised your hand a minute ago, I thought you were saying, I'm ready to go home. That's why I said, I got an honest person here. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Homework assignment for this month. Next month, our lesson is going to be on soul winning. And then we will have two more. We got three more lessons, including next month. So next month is going to be on soul winning. And your homework assignment is to bring somebody to church. That has not been here since we come. And the reason I clarified it that way is it's very easy to grab somebody that's been here in the last couple of months and say, I re-invited them. I want you to go out and get somebody come to church that has not been here in the past year. Okay. And in the meantime, finish inviting your 30. Okay. God bless you. Let's all stand. Somebody must cut the air off because it's getting hot in here. <laughs> it's all right. We're fixing to leave. <clears throat> Just having trouble breathing. <clears throat> I am going to ask um, Jackson, dismiss us in prayer tonight. Somebody, go about somebody. And if you want a head start, next month's homework assignment is going to be teaching a Bible study. Ooh. So you can actually go ahead and get started. Well, yes. I hope you guys You're welcome to do the one hour.